the great exchange. Let's go to Genesis chapter 18, reading from verse 23. And if you apply the principle of opposites, you'll be amazed at how Bible truth will come alive. We'll just look at a few examples of opposites in the Bible. In Genesis 18 verse 13, the Bible says, And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with whom? The wicked. Abraham divides the world into two groups, righteous and wicked. There is not a third group. In Luke chapter 19, reading verse 10, Jesus said, I am come, or the Son of Man is come, to seek and to save that which was lost. In this world, a person is either lost or saved. There isn't a middle state. Now let me say something about being lost. You can be lost with hope, or you can be lost without hope. And I need to explain that quickly. While Noah was building the ark, he preached for 120 years. How many of the people listening to him entered the ark? Let's exclude his family. How many? None. None. Now, while he was preaching, they were lost. But they had a chance to enter the ark by accepting what Noah was saying. So they were lost with hope. But when God closed the door of the ark, they were in the same lost condition, but this time without hope. Is that clear? So Jesus says the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. You're either saved or you're lost. You're either righteous or you're wicked. Christ Object Lessons, page 283, paragraph 3. Ellen White tells us there are only two classes in the world today, and only two classes will be recognized in the judgment. Those who violate God's law and those who obey it, and that's it. Only two classes will be recognized in the judgment. Those who violate God's law and those who obey it. Why am I saying this? I'm saying that because the Bible, a book of opposites, a book of either or. Let's go to Luke 11. Let's see this either or principle in a very serious way. Luke 11, we shall read from verse 24. And our subject is the great exchange. Luke 11, reading from verse 24. Jesus says, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest. And finding none, he saith, I will return unto my house from whence I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Why was the last state of that man worse than the first? When Jesus Christ cast out a demon or demons, that space vacated by the demons must be filled by something else. Are you following me? In the natural world, we are told nature abhors a vacuum. The same applies spiritually. There are no vacuums spiritually. All space is either filled from a moral standpoint by the principles of Satan or by the principles of God. Now when someone comes to Christ and Christ rebukes the evil spirit, Christ redeems that person, that person must now occupy that space with the things of God. If that does not happen, Satan comes back with a double vengeance. The great exchange. That's my way of saying, when God forgives, what does he do? 
when or someone said forgets that's part of it when God forgives and I'm sure all of us have at one point or another said Lord forgive me when you pray that from your heart if it's not from the heart God does not respond when you and I say from the heart God I am sorry forgive me what does he do when someone comes to Christ having lived a life of sin is convicted by the truth and that person is converted what does God do all right someone says cleanse all of that is correct let's look at the great exchange David prayed create in me a clean heart why would someone say create in me a clean heart the only reason why David would pray that prayer was because his heart was unclean because of his sin with Bathsheba and the subsequent murder and David was in that state of sin for a while until Nathan the prophet came spoke the words of God David was painfully and powerfully convicted and repented of his sin David's heart was unclean David's heart was sinful David's heart was corrupt that's why Ellen White said he needed to be reconverted there's only one thing you're converted from and that is sin the power of sin the dominance of sin the slavery of sin and David prayed create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me that's David's way of saying I'm sorry forgive me when you and I pray that prayer God has two things to move he has to move the sin from you and me and he has to move something into our lives the Bible is a fairly simple book if you read it honestly prayerfully and with dependence on God's Holy Spirit let me say that again when God forgives the word forgive afiemi, is to give for is to take something away when God in response to our prayer forgive me God moves something from me and moves something to me or in me now we know God moves the sin what does God move into me what does God move into you when you pray the prayer of forgiveness God replaces the sin with righteousness because righteousness and sin are opposites what is righteousness righteousness is conformity with God's law I've told you all week my purpose for this week was to magnify God's law and make it honorable by connecting it with Jesus Christ and the gospel and let me tell you quickly if the law disappears the gospel disappears let me say that again if the law vanishes the gospel vanishes the law the gospel and Christ are inseparable and so when God forgives he removes the sin but what gives God the right to remove the sin it's not just your prayer and mine my prayer does not give God the right to do anything it provides an opportunity not the right are you following me it provides God an opportunity to do what he loves to do which is forgive but the the basis on which God forgives is not my prayer the basis on which God forgives sin and converts the sinner and renews the heart is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ sin is a violation of God's law and the law will accept two things perfect obedience or the death of the offending person let me repeat that the law accepts demands two things keep me perfectly or lay down your life
That's why the Bible says, anyone who keeps the law will live in the law. The problem is no one can keep the law. No one has kept the law. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Curses everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. The law says to us, if you can keep me perfectly, fine. But no one can keep God's law perfectly if you sin once. Even if you repent, you have still broken the law once. And all your repentance cannot go back and make up for that violation. Let me say that again. If you and I sin just once, no amount of forgiveness, no amount of repentance can make up for that violation. What the law wants is a perfection that has no flaws. That's the only way something can be perfect. The only person who has done that, tell me who he is. Jesus Christ. The law has no problem with Christ. His life is precisely what the law requires of you and me, but we cannot give it. Now we've got to go to Christ. And Christ's perfect, perfect life, Christ's perfect obedience, when we surrender to him, is attributed to us. But I said there's something else the law wants and accepts. That's death. You and I sinned, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the law says somebody has to die. Not only to satisfy the demands of the law, but the life given up must also be a life that not only pays the price of sin, but also provides redemption, provides power to allow that person to live above sin. That life that is given up through death must pay the demands of the law and provide power to live a life that pleases God. Only the life of Jesus Christ can do that. Let me try to explain. Jesus Christ satisfied the law. He lived a sinless life, past, present, sinless. That's what the law wants. By the way, that's what God wants from us. God has one standard, that's his character. It's expressed in the law. But God knows we cannot reach it. God sends Jesus Christ that through him we may become acceptable to God through or in the beloved. Now the life that is given up, cannot be somebody else's life. The life through which we may overcome sin cannot be somebody else's life. Let me explain. Why could not an angel come and die for you and for me? Because the angel's life does not belong to him. You didn't get it. Let me try again. An angel cannot give up his life, a life that can allow us to be victorious over sin because his life is not his. The angel can give up a life somebody else gave him. I cannot die for your sins because my life is not mine. But Jesus Christ, who calls himself the resurrection and the life, his life is his. That's why he can say, I lay down what? My life. I cannot say that. An angel cannot say that. Only Jesus Christ can say that. And that's the only life that can provide victory for us. So the life of Christ and the death of Christ, the death meets the demands of the law. Someone must die. And the life provides the power to live a victorious life in the sight of God. Jesus Christ alone provides that. So when you and I confess our sins and God forgives us, we still need Christ. Because the law can say, but you sinned in 1965. And by so doing, you destroyed the perfect life. But the law cannot say that to Jesus Christ. And so when you and I are in Christ and Christ in us, the life of Christ becomes our life.
And so the great exchange, Jesus Christ takes what rightfully belongs to us. What's that? Sin. And gives us what rightfully belongs to him. What's that? His righteous life. Now this is no make-believe. This is actually what happens. But when Christ gives you his righteous life, when the Father is pleased to forgive on the basis of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, what does he give in that righteous life? As I said earlier, when Christ gives his righteous life, he gives us a life in conformity to God's law. Let me explain it this way, to show the connection between Christ and the law. Many churches, they stage skits and plays for the young people in AY, you have plays and skits. I'm not promoting plays and skits, by the way. I'm just using an example with which we're familiar. Or you turn on the television and you watch a movie. Every movie is based on what? A script. Are you with me? Are you with me? Every movie is based on a script, and I'm not promoting movies, I'm using something with which we're familiar. Every play in a theater is based on a script. Now, the law of God is the written script. Are you listening to me? Are you listening? The life of Christ is that script brought to life. You shut down the script. What do you shut down? The play. You have to convince me today you're listening. Let me say it again. Let's say you're a stage, you are a director of a play. You're sitting where you're sitting. All the actors are on the stage. You have in your hand the script. The script says someone enters from the left, someone enters from the right. Then the person who enters sits down. Now, if the person, instead of sitting down, lies down, what do you say? It's not where? In the script. So when I keep Sunday as a Sabbath, what does the director of the play of life say? It is not in the script. And then you say, well, can someone show me what the script is like when it's played out? And the, the script says, look at Jesus. The life of Christ is the script enacted. You shut down the script, you shut down the life of Christ, and the script is the law. What am I saying? Let me say it differently. The law of God is a package that's wrapped. From UPS. The life of Christ is that package what? Come on, I give you a clue. The law of God is a package that's wrapped. The life of Christ is that package what? Unwrapped. Because of our limited minds, because of our limited minds, we cannot fully understand and grasp God's law. And so Jesus says, here is what you're trying to understand. Watch me. Everything the law says, watch me. And in every detail of the letter, every detail of the Spirit, Jesus Christ fulfilled. And he says to you and to me, that's what the law is, me, my life. So when people say there is no law, they might as well say there is no Christ. And so the script, which is God's law, that is what is written on our hearts. Simultaneously, the life of Christ is given to us. So that the script in the heart produces the life in everything we do. Can you say amen? The script in the heart produces the play of righteousness. And I hate the word play, but I can't think of another word. And so God forgives. He takes away Satan's script from your heart and mine. 
which produces a satanic play in our lives. That's the life of sin. And he replaces it with the righteous script of God's law, which by the power of Christ produces the life of Christ in the converted person. And so when David said, create in me a new heart, he was asking God, using my own terms, remove the script of Satan, which produced adultery and murder, and put the script of the law, which produces a righteous life. The great exchange. God takes our sin and puts it on Jesus Christ. By the way, that is his job description among many, to carry your sins and mine. Now, when you think of sin, what do you think of? Corruption, guilt, what else? Blame, suffering, wrath, the curse of God. When your sins and mine are placed on Christ, Christ takes the sin, he takes the wrath of God, he takes the curse of God, he takes the blame for sin, he takes the guilt that crushes the sinner. Jesus takes everything that goes with sin and then he gives to you and me the very character of his father, the righteous life as expressed in the law of God. God has high standards for us. In Conflict and Courage, page 21, paragraph 5, Ellen White writes, God made man for his own glory, that after test and trial, the human family might become one with the heavenly family. Let me say that again. After test and trial, the human family might become one with the heavenly family. It was God's purpose to repopulate heaven with the human family if they would show themselves obedient to his every word. God's original intention was that if mankind would be faithful, he would somehow unite humanity with divinity. Now, human beings love to be associated with big shots. We love to drop names. I know the governor of California. I had lunch with Barack Obama. I know whomever. I play golf with the president of some place. I went to school with the Queen of England. We love to drop names because dropping a name brings some luster and some glow to me. How about dropping God's name? Hmm? Because God's desire is to make you and me one with him. As I said, he has high standards and God's standard for you and for me when he carries out the process of forgiveness is to make you and me like him in character, not in substance. Only Jesus is like God in substance. You and I don't need to be like God in substance because a created being cannot be God, but a created being can be God-like in character. And so God looks at every one of us under the sound of his servant's voice. And God's desire for you and for me is that we think, speak, and act like God. You didn't hear me. <laughs> what God is competing with is the low standards we have for ourselves. The Bible says in Psalm 8, Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. The actual word translated angels is Elohim. Thou hast made him a little lower than gods. Now listen to me carefully. Ellen White writes, Conflict and Courage, page 34, paragraph 5. Those who lived before the flood, listen carefully, were only a few steps from God. Here's God, here's Gabriel, here are all the angels, various levels of angelic authority. 
and Ellen White writes, just a few steps under God were the antediluvians. Now you chew on that. Now consider if the antediluvians in their condition were just a few steps below God, what is God's desire for us when he redeems us from sin? God's desire for you and for me and it begins through the process of forgiveness and forgiveness and justification are the same thing is to begin that process of restoring us to that closeness to him in character. Ellen White writes, Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1070, Paragraph 6, Pardon and Justification are one and the same thing. When God pardons, he makes you right. When God justifies, he makes you right. He makes you righteous. And the only standard of righteousness God has is himself, his character, which was reflected by his son, which was an outworking of the divine script called God's law. My brothers and sisters, what I'm trying to tell you, when God forgives, when God converts, when God redeems, God has begun a process of making you and me like him. And he does that by putting the transcript of his character into our hearts before a man is converted or a woman that person's anthem is don't tell me what to do when a person is converted the person's anthem is what will thou have me to do let me make you dizzy with this statement from Ellen White Here's what genuine conversion does for us with regard to God's law and the change in our hearts. The law of God is to be obeyed even if there were no authority to enforce it and no reward for its obedience. Signs of the Times, September 24, 1894, paragraph 4. The law of God is to be obeyed even if there were no authority to enforce it and no reward for its obedience. This is the state to which we arrive when God's law of love occupies our heart. We don't care if there's a reward. We, don't, we just love to obey. Are you with me? The opposite of that is the unconverted man. We love to disobey. It's an amazing statement, but we see some of that in the lives of uh, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, better known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when Nebuchadnezzar threatened them in verse 15 of chapter 3 of Daniel. The Bible says in verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, if there's no reward we don't care our heart is to obey a converted heart does not look for reward a converted heart highest impetus or desire is to please God reward is not its motivation at all What I just said runs cross grain to human nature. Human nature is, what's in this for me? A converted person says, what's in this for God? Where did that thinking come from? It came from God. Desire of Ages, page 131, paragraph 2, speaking of Jesus Christ, Ellen White writes, He not only became an exile from the heavenly courts, but for us took the risk of failure and eternal loss. In other words, Christ was saying, look, if I have to lose everything, I will lose it to save them. And the father said, if I have to lose everything by losing my son, I will lose everything in order to save them. When that character is placed in us, we think the same way. I am willing to lose everything to please God.
and willing to suffer any sacrifice to please God. That is the law of God working on the heart. The great exchange. Give me your sin, I give you my righteousness. Or it may be expressed differently, give me self and I will give you love. Somebody say amen. amen. Give me self. In Hebrews 2, 9, the Bible says, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Let's look at that verse as we talk about give me self, take love. Think with me. This is a good time to say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. The Bible says Jesus tasted death for every man. The Bible also says the dead know nothing. A dead person cannot taste death. To taste death, you have to taste it while you're alive. I know you're not listening. <laughs> you're not listening. But you look good, but you're not listening. <laughs> Let me try that again. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 5. The dead know how much? Nothing. The Bible says Jesus tasted death. A dead man cannot taste death. Jesus must have tasted death before he died. What death? You see, any death could not satisfy the law. A death that's the foundation of a, a victorious life could not be any death. If Jesus had sinned, he would still have died, but that death would have been useless. Because death is the way that life is poured out. So the death of a sinner who actually chose to sin could not satisfy. It had to be the death of a sinless person. And Jesus, in his life, he died to self. That's why he says, if any man will come after me, let him do what? Deny, as if it doesn't exist, put it to death. Slay it, crucify self. He tasted that. Every temptation, Jesus said, no, why? For the Father's glory. Every attempt by the enemy to detract, to uh, derail Jesus Christ from the path of salvation, from his Father's will, Jesus Christ resisted. We know he had his own will. That's why he said, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not mine, but thine. Jesus Christ, in every encounter, he sacrificed self. And so he can testify in John 8, 29. He that hath sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone. Who can finish that verse? For I do always the things that please him. Jesus means by that verse, he never acted on a selfish motive. Let me say it again. If he did always the things that please somebody else, every act, every thought, every word, was carried out for the interest of someone else. Jesus Christ never acted on a selfish motive. I didn't say a selfish motive didn't come across his mind. I said he never acted on it. Now that is the love of God because love has no self and sin has no love. And so in the great exchange, God takes self, which is the same thing as saying he takes sin and he gives love, which is the same thing as saying he gives righteousness, which is the same thing as saying he gives his righteous law. He takes his law, puts the script in our hearts, writes it on the heart, and that script on the heart produces the righteous play of our lives. Have you experienced the great exchange? Have you given Christ 
your sins. Have we surrendered all? Let me just go back to Luke 11 when Christ said that when the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, what some people do, they fill some of the space with the things of God, but a little space they leave for their own control. A little space is still left for the devil. That's not surrender to Christ. Listen to me. A surrender to Christ is a surrender without reservation. Let me ask you this to explain what I just said. When God gave Christ, how much did he give? Everything he had. You can't have anything left when you give Christ. Christ is creator, sustainer, he is God. He owns the entire universe. All things were made by him and for him. Colossians 1.16, all things that the Father hath are mine. John 16.15, they all belong to Christ. He created them. He owns them. He sustains them. Everything is under the control of Christ. He's the one the Father gave. The Father gave everything. He had nothing left. As I said a few days ago, I think to someone, when God gave Christ, he ran out of benevolence. How can an infinite God run out of benevolence? Our high calling, page 12, paragraph 3, God has exhausted his benevolence in pouring out all of heaven to man in one great gift. He exhausted, God said, I have nothing left to give. Education, page 76, paragraph 3, Ellen White writes, Christ came to the world with the accumulated love of eternity. Take a minute to recover your senses. Listen to the words again of the inspired pen. Christ came to the world with the accumulated love of eternity. Does eternity end? No. Yet somehow, Christ and the Father gathered all the love that can fit into eternity and it came with Christ. <laughs> to save you. Christ came with all the accumulated love of eternity. And he puts that somehow in us by writing his law on our hearts. Our response is to love God with everything we have, with our own human eternity, if I may say that. We love God with everything because God loved us first with everything. And so God says to you, can you give up a cigarette for me? And people say no. God says, can you give up going to the club for me? seeing I give up everything for you. We say no. God says, can you stop breaking my Sabbath? We say no. And the thing about God, anything he asks you and me to give up is not good for us. But what he gave up was good for him. Are you following me? Whatever God gave up for us was a blessing to him. Whatever he asked us to give, us for, to give up for him is a curse to us. God tells you, let go what is hurting you because I let go what I was loving. A great exchange. Today, God wants to create in you and me a clean heart. A heart is only clean if the law of God exists in that heart. Because spiritual uncleanness is sin. Sin is the violation of the law. To create a clean heart, the standard of cleanliness must be put there. And that is God's law. Which is the gospel wrapped up. And the gospel opened up is Jesus Christ. Let me say it again. The law of God is the parcel 
The gospel is the parcel opened up. Christ's life is the parcel opened up. One cannot be separated from the other. And so the gospel of God is the message that there is a way to return to a law-abiding life as Adam had before he sinned. And what is that way? Jesus Christ. The gospel is the message that heaven has provided a way to return to the life Adam lived before he sinned. Did you hear what I said? Because God has never changed his standard. When Adam sinned, the standard remained the same. The gospel now provides power to come up to that standard. And that power is the very life of Christ, which is what God offers us today. You don't go to Christ get power and then walk away the power is Christ himself are you with me the life is Christ himself through the agency of the Holy Spirit how Christ dwells in me I don't bother to try to explain I cannot but the Bible says it happens he dwells in us through the Spirit and so the script is in my heart Christ the unfolding of that script is in my heart my life must be a precise rendition of the script and the life of Jesus Christ. The great exchange, God is offering you his character as expressed in the life of his son, which is an unfolding of the law of God. That is what God offers you and me, his life. Do not say no. The law has no problem with someone who is covered by the life of Jesus Christ. The life covers you, the life is in you. So Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. He died to self. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. This is the offer today. Let God carry out the great exchange. My brothers and sisters, give Christ your sins today. Even those we carry along on a leash because they were pet sins. Give them to Christ today. And if you trust completely in his atonement, meaning the life he lived, his death, his resurrection, all of that is the atonement, then you will receive the life of Christ. Your life will change. As someone told me a few weeks ago, I was in a uh, Kenya preaching. The lady said when she met Christ, her life changed. She said things just started to fall off. They started to fall off. She just lost her taste for this and for that. She said they just began to fall off because she had given herself entirely to Christ. It's time for us to experience the falling of the leaves of sin from our lives. Let them fall off as Jesus Christ works within us. I'm closing the book to let you know I'm finishing. Have you experienced a great exchange? Or do you still have the receipt for your sins? Give them to Christ. That's his job description. Let him give you his righteous life as scripted in the law and expressed in the life he lived when he walked on this earth. Is there someone listening to me who is willing to say, Lord, this message has opened my eyes. I want your life in me through Jesus Christ who will say that with me I want your life I really do I want your life it's the only life suited for heaven I want your life I want you to stand with me then I have another question for you I want your life that great exchange I want it life for death sin for righteousness imperfection for perfection the mind of Satan for the mind of Christ I want that life. Is there someone listening? The Spirit has touched your heart. You need, listen to me carefully, you need to resume your walk with God. Start all over. What you've been doing up to this point is just a habit, force of habit. You need to start all over. Having come to this week of revival, 
having heard this message today, you need to start all over. Because you realize you might have been trusting to your own good works. If you want to say, Father, I need to start my walk all over again today. If there's someone who'll say that, young or old, with pure honesty, raise your right hand. I need to start, oh. Come. Come quickly. Come. I need to start all over. Come. Don't let pride on what people will say. You're coming to say, I need to start all over. David started all over. That's why he was reconverted. I really need to start all over. That's the call. I need to start all over. Come. Life is uncertain. The best time to make that kind of decision is now. Tomorrow's promise to no one, not even tonight. Not even lunch. Now. Anything God offers you is for your benefit. Anything he takes from you has been hurting you. I need to start all over. Come. You know the words of that song, surrender all to Christ. That's the only way Christ can transform you and me. The surrender must be total. It cannot be partial. You do not surrender to Christ on layaway. It must be total because his gift was total. Some of you made a decision last night to be baptized or rebaptized. Those of you who have not yet made that decision and you know in your heart you need to be rebaptized or baptized, I want you to raise your right hand. You've not yet made it. Sister God bless you. Someone come and take her name for me quickly. You need to be baptized or rebaptized. Make the decision now. Raise your right hand. Sister, God bless you. Okay. Come a little closer. I want to distinguish you. Come a little closer, sister. If you raised your hand, come a little closer. Don't be afraid. Your decision pleases heaven. Don't be afraid. I want these names taken, please. We have three sisters. It's either to be baptized or rebaptized. Oh, I have two other hands right here. God bless you. Come to the front. Come to the front. Come, come, come. Let them through, please. Come right to the front. Let them through. God bless you. It's a call. I need to be rebaptized or baptized as I start all over with God. Raise your hand. Come, sister. Come, come. God bless you. Come, come. I want all the names taken. Come right over here. Come right over here. The rest of you should be praying that hearts will be softened. Anyone else? Raise that hand so I can see it. Move it so I can see it. I need to be baptized. Remarry Jesus Christ. Or baptized for the first time. Raise your hand. Move it so I can see it. And I don't want to delay you. We have a long day ahead of us. I want that great exchange. It's a literal exchange. Anyone else? Do we have all the names? We want your telephone numbers and the churches you attend so we know who to contact. Anyone else? Listen to me. You have drifted from God. You left the church. You're like to come back to God's remnant church. You have drifted from the church, lived a life contrary to the church's standards and principles. You want to come back to God's remnant church at the invitation of the Spirit, raise your right hand. Sister, come. Come, sister. Come, come. Yes, come, come. Don't worry, come, come. I want to come back. I have drifted. I want to come back. Come, sister. Let her come all the way through. I've drifted. And more of us have drifted than we will imagine. Have, let her come all the way to the front. We want her name. Let her through. She's coming right there. Let her through. God bless you for your courage, sister. I have drifted from God. I want to come back. Come, sister, all the way to the front. Come, let her through. Give us your name. God bless you. Someone else. I have drifted from God. I want to come back. 
I'm going to pray. 60 seconds and I pray. They begin now. Want to be baptized? Rebaptized? I have drifted from God and I know I have. I want to come back as the Spirit has touched my heart and never leave Him again. Come. 60 seconds begin now. And I won't delay the call as I did last night. 45 seconds. seconds mm. 15 seconds I want to be baptized make the decision rebaptize make the decision I have drifted I want to come back to my God who make that decision If you're shy, see us right after the service, but God loves public declarations of our willingness to serve him. Calvary was not done dark at night, in a corner somewhere, it was public. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Our loving Father in heaven, we will never fully understand your love. We must try through a study of the life of Christ but throughout eternity we will be learning learning revelations of your love dear God in heaven the word has been preached hearts have been touched people have responded I am asking you in the name of Jesus Christ who gave his life and because you love us also dear God let your spirit move on the hearts that are still resisting that many more may surrender and give that life to you that you may carry out that great exchange our sins for your righteous life father in heaven we thank you for the law of God which was the script of the life of Jesus Christ and there was no variation between the life and the script and this is the script he writes on our hearts that we may live the same life he lived by his indwelling power please father move on those hearts that are resisting this may be the last chance some people have to respond Thank you for those who have come. Grant them a double portion of your spirit that they may remain firm in their decision. Because Satan will do everything in his power to dissuade and to discourage them. The wild heads are still bowed. Eyes are still closed. For the last time, who wants to say, Father, I'm deciding today I'm willing to be baptized. Rebaptized or I've drifted, I'm coming back to you. One of the three. Baptize, rebaptize. I've drifted. I'm coming back. I see a hand. Right there. Give my brother a card. He can indicate whether it's rebaptism, baptism, or coming back from a life of drifting. Anyone else? Then I close the prayer. I'm making a decision to be baptized. Remarry Jesus Christ. Or baptize, rebaptize, or come back from a life of drifting. Make that decision now, just before I close the prayer. Anyone else? Father, thank you for the work of your spirit. If I have preached badly, forgive me. Help me to do better next time. Make the message clearer. Grant all of us your spirit. Open our eyes to see your love. Pursue those who are still running from you. Chase them until you catch them. Do everything on your power to make them surrender short of forcing them. That when you come, we may all be found safe to save. I offer this prayer from my heart in Jesus' name and for his sake. Let all God's people say, Amen. And amen. Stay where you are.